Welcome to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Last week, the Chinese government admitted for the first time that so-called cancer villages exist as decades of pollution take their toll on the health of Chinese citizens. So far, the U.S., U.K., German, Swiss, Italian, Spanish, and French governments have yet to admit that so-called cancer markets exist as decades of toxic fraudulent derivatives take their toll on the wealth of global citizens. In Iran last week, four bankers sentenced to death for bank fraud after they forged documents allegedly used to secure loans totaling $2.6 billion to buy state-owned enterprises. Meanwhile, in Australia, a temp agency jokes in an ad to kill existing workers and replace them with temps who can also be killed when no longer needed. And you thought joking about killing banksters was going too far. Ha, ha, ha. The joke's on you, worker, peasant, sucker. Stacy. <laughs> yes, Max. Well, why don't we take a little look at a, a clip of that ad where they just off any worker who is inconvenient. And they actually come to the point where they say, let's just do it on an hourly basis. Hi, I'm Genevieve George, the CEO of One Shift. I'm so confident in our people that I'm stepping down and letting one of Hi, uh, I'm George. I'm the CEO of One Shift. Hey well, for, for one shift. Yes, demand too many rights. Exhibit any sort of human quality, like if they get tired, they do note that if, if they're tired after lunch, just get rid of them. And I like the uh, comparison to how the temp agency can joke about killing workers, but if you talk about banksters being killed for fraud or terrorism or money laundering, or if Iran does the understandable thing and killing banksters, or China recently killed some banksters, suddenly, oh, that's you're being terrible, that's taboo, you can't kill the banksters. It's an example of Stockholm Syndrome, people are being held captive by banksters, fall in love with their hostage takers, the banksters, but uh, making uh, jokes about themselves getting murdered, oh, that's hilarious, ha 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 ha. Well, speaking of the Stockholm Syndrome and falling in love with your captive, in Japan, they often fall in love with uh, blow-up dolls, right? Because they don't have any human emotions and they're very simple. They don't demand anything. They just perform a function for you. And I think that's where our friend Miss Shedlock has gone with this headline, Robots Don't Commit Suicide and Other Robot Advantages. Robots don't eat, drink, demand coffee breaks, or protest working conditions, and they certainly don't commit suicide. So Mish is saying that this is a good thing that the CEO, Terry Gu, of Foxconn in China, which produces most of those iPhones and many other electronic products, is replacing a lot of the workers. There's a freeze now on hiring because he's replacing them with a million robots. This is not going to help the uh, worker situation. And those who vilify workers, vilify unions, in America in particular, but glorify the central bank, are um, really setting themselves up for a, a, a total uh, societal breakdown. If, if you're going to have a central bank, then you need workers' pay tied to money supply. That, that's the way to get around this conundrum. Don't replace the workers with robots. Uh, but what will happen is that the central bank will be replaced with a robot, and that robot will be set to stun and kill more than it already is. Well, Mish goes on to say, get rid of a million workers, replace them with a million robots, and you get rid of a million complaints about working conditions, as well as unwanted, high-profile, work-related suicides. And I think this is something we see throughout the economy. We have become hyper-focused on just these numbers, and the, the annoyance, the nuisance always in many of the arguments is people get in the way. You know, they have babies, they, you know, women give birth to a child who needs health care for their entire lives. So it throws a spanner into the works of health care. Um, we have people who get into fights, fall in love, have wars, all sorts of things get in the way. So his argument could be extended to the entire uh, situation. Like, OK, you mentioned the cancer villages in China. Well, robots don't get cancer either. So what about all these pesky humans that keep on complaining about their children getting cancer because of all the toxic dump into the, uh, into the river or the lake nearby? Well, let's just get rid of the humans because if we got rid of the humans and all those pesky problems and toilet breaks and food and hunger and all that stuff, we would have 
amazing efficiency, amazing GDP growth, the economy would be booming. Well, you already see it on, on Wall Street and in the city of London where they have high frequency trading. These are robots, algorithmic trading are robots, and they are set to steal money. And then when Lloyd Blankfein or Jamie Dimon or uh, Hester here in the UK is caught stealing money, they simply say, it wasn't me, it was the robot. So that's their defense, and they get away with it. Or they try to go to a jury trial, and the jury is so stupid because they've been fed drugs and GMO seeds that they don't know how to render a verdict, so they get off for that. Uh, but just killing workers by the millions and replacing them with the robots has a very kind of genocidal feel to it, and anyone who's promoting that is pro-genocide. You know, the fact is, as we've covered with Andy Grove, the co-founder of Intel, he was saying that it's on the factory floor where innovation happens. You can't teach innovation, and therefore you certainly cannot program innovation. So if we had had Mish's you know, dream future, but imagine it had been set back to, somebody just sent me a photo, a five megabyte computer with a hard drive. It used to have to be airlifted in, the computer was so big. I mean, what if we had just replaced humans with those computers? And that's the extent of innovation that ever happened because it's humans and all their darned demands and needs and bathroom breaks and lunch breaks that is what creates innovation. It's the problem is that the money has dried up. So you have something like Lord of the Flies happening on a global basis, global scale is that those who have a few shekels to rub together are now doing their best to kill off everybody else. A until such time as the money starts to flow again, the credit starts to flow again. But that won't happen for another 10 or 20 years. You know, the fact is also, many of the people on the comments board there were saying, well, this is great if we, you know, we can't fight technology. And if we get all replaced by these robots, you know, we could just sit around and they'll create all sorts of abundance for us discounting the fact that, yet again, the stubborn quality of nature is that there is a limit to resources. So there's always going to be a stubborn little thing to get in the way of the technological growth. Plus, the robots, of course, are protected with intellectual property laws. Mm. And that's an illegal monopoly under any free enterprise system. So that's where Mish's argument breaks down again is that he's promoting monopoly in intellectual property, perpetual copyright and patent laws, which are completely anathema to free markets and competition. Well, robots may not commit suicide, but they certainly do commit murder. Killer robots must be stopped, say, campaigners. Autonomous weapons, which could be ready within a decade, pose grave risks to international law, claim activists. These are an activist group called stop the killer robots. And they say that right now, robot warfare and autonomous weapons are the next step from unmanned drones and are already being worked on by scientists and will be available within the decade, said Dr. Noel Sharkey, a leading robotics and artificial intelligence expert and professor at Sheffield University. He believes that development of the weapons is taking place in an effectively unregulated environment with little attention being paid to moral implications and international law. See, again, it's these pesky Geneva Conventions because people have these pesky notions of, like, human rights. Well, the robots don't understand human rights. Right. At, at the next Nuremberg trial, uh, <laughs> everybody on trial will get off because they'll simply say, the robots did it. Uh, the ro We don't know. We, all those people died. We, the robots, they got a brain of themselves. They decided to kill everybody. We didn't know what happened. But we took all the money. We took all the property. We got rich by it. That was just a collateral damage. We had no idea what really happened. The robots did it. Therefore, he can't hang us. Exactly. You know, speaking of Nuremberg trials, you would interrogate the person and question how their motives and what, they, what their motives were behind this. Of course, as you mentioned, there's copyright and proprietary trading information, so you're not allowed to look at the algorithm of these robots and, and what, how, what the algorithm said of who to kill. That's right. The Wall Street banks who steal money through high-frequency trading by co-locating computers next to the exchange and siphoning off cash say, you can't prosecute us because the technology by which we steal money is proprietary and that's protected under copyright law. And going back to this piece about killer robots, Dr. Noel Sharkey says, quote, this is going to be big, big money. But actually, there is no transparency, no legal process. The laws of war allow for rights of surrender, for prisoner of war rights, for a human face to take judgments on collateral damage. Humans are thinking, sentient beings. If a robot goes wrong, who is accountable? Certainly not the robot. Right, and the robots are evolving which is something that in, let's say, Christian extremist America, they don't believe in evolution, but they're gonna be wiped out by an evolving class of robots. 
Well, I don't think they will because I think innovation will then stop. We'll have these uh, non-suicidal, homicidal robots running the world. We won't advance to anywhere past this because they're not, they don't have the sentient human wants and desires. I think it's desire and want and needs that makes innovation happen. They don't have any needs but what they're programmed for. What if the white puff of smoke at the Vatican goes up and they open the doors and the cardinals elected a robot to be the next pope? Well, that's exactly where- Robo pope! <laughs> <laughs> well, that's exactly where this is going because, of course, a robo pope would have none of these human flaws. That's right. He would be able to keep his weenie and his wing wang. It would truly be infallible. <laughs> that's right. Maybe this is the second coming. <laughs> that's really gross. <laughs> I'm talking about what they said in the Bible. <laughs> so, finally, speaking of robots, SEC wins asset freeze after Heinz traders fail to appear. A U.S. judge froze a Goldman Sachs account that regulators say was used to make suspicious trades in H.J. Heinz company after unknown traders failed to appear in court to defend their claims to assets. This defendant who failed to show up in court, it could have just been an algorithm is my argument. It was known as certain unknown traders in the securities of H.J. Heinz and company. And so basically they bought some options uh, a large amount at $90,000, which rose by 2,000% with this insider trading information uh, to up to $1.8 million from their $90,000 investment. Right, well, clear case of insider trading. They just didn't pick up the money that they made, but they can always make it back doing some other insider trading. No prosecutions, no laws against it anymore. It's just open season for fraud. Yeah, and of course, these algorithms, the SEC was able to spot an unusual blip in this trading activity, because even for several days beforehand, there were zero options traded on Heinz, and then suddenly $90,000 worth at 40 cents were bought. So- No, we saw the same thing uh, before 9-11. Yes. There's a lot of insider trading around 9-11 with Buzzy Krongard and the CIA, and it was in the 9-11 report. It's a clear case of insider trading, but nobody bothered to investigate because uh, it would implicate the algorithmic trading of Wall Street that is key to the survival of the robot nation called America, City of London, Frankfurt. Thanks so much, Stacey Herbert, for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. All right, stay tuned for the second half. We'll be speaking to Dominic Frisbee, author, comedian, and gold bug. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn to Dominic Frisbee, author, comedian, and resident gold bug at Money Week. Dominic, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Thank you very much for having me back, Max. All right, Dominic, as I said, you are a gold bug. Now, everybody is talking about the so-called death cross. What is this technical indicator, mm -hmm. and does it matter? Well, the, uh, what the death cross is, uh, there's all sorts of death crosses that can occur, but in gold, you have the 200-day moving average and the 50-day moving average, which is the average price of gold over the last 50 days or gold over the last 200 days. And when the 50-day moving average crosses down through the 200-day moving average, you have a death cross, and that is supposed to be a bearish signal. And when you have, when the 50-day moving average crosses up through the 200 moving average and the price is above that, that is what's known as a golden cross, and that's seen as a buy signal. But in my opinion, it's a lagging indicator. It sometimes helps you identify tra trends, uh, but if you're a gold bug, I wouldn't worry too much about it. I've spent many long nights staring at the gold price and the gold chart in the early hours of the morning where perhaps I should have been watching something else but I was looking at the gold price and I've back test tested it and it's not really that effective a technical tool. Yeah, it sounds to awfully gold. interesting. Death cross and the geeks and nerds that follow technical analysis can make believe that they're involved in some drama when in fact it's nothing but squiggles on a piece of paper. The fundamental case for gold has never been stronger. Central banks are buying gold by the hundreds of tons. Uh, the uh, repatriation of gold by countries of Germany now showing distrust among central banks. The continued yeah. money printing by central banks. Mark Carney being parachuted into the UK to print money. What do you think of Mark Carney coming into the UK? The reason Mark Carney has got the job is that the Tories want to engineer some kind of boom in time for the next election so that they get uh, have a better chance of being re-elected. I mean, I just think that's awful. That It will be an artificial boom. It will be a centrally central bank-created boom. Um, boom, and he is one of the most inflationist central bankers out there, and that's why he's got the gig. Okay, now, so it is, there is a political agenda there. Well, going back to 30 years, going back to the Reagan-Thatcher booms of the uh, 80s, 
This idea of pumping money into the economy has resulted in some GDP growth. But over the past, over that period of 30 years, for every dollar of debt that you're pumping into the economy, you're getting less and less of a GDP boom. Now it looks as though that trick of flooding the economy with debt is not working anymore. So it's like the economy is a corpse. You're transfusing blood into the corpse, but you end up with what you have around the world now, zombie economies. Is the trick gonna work this time? And if it doesn't work this time, is that really gonna portend a very sharp uh, consequence? Nobody knows. And I mean, you're absolutely right. It creates zombies. In my opinion, it creates the wrong sort of growth. I'm all for the growth in ideas, growth in efficiency, that kind of thing. But as you say, they are merely pumping blood into the zombie and it takes more and more blood to get the zombie to move. Um, is it going to end in some kind of inflationary collapse or disaster? I doubt it. I just think it'll end in, in more stagnation. The great thing about this monetary system that we have is that it benefits those closest to its issuance, those closest to money's issuance, at the expense of everyone else. So I think you'll see the middle class uh, get squeezed even further. You'll see the gap between the very rich and the very poor get even larger. The very rich, that kind of 2 or 3% right at the top who are closest to money, issuance, those who are holding on to assets such as central London property or art or that kind of thing, they will all benefit and everyone else will sink further and further into debt and anger. What, what about <laughs> this um, idea that David Cameron seems to be financially illiterate? He was uh, mentioning in the House of Commons recently that there's been a reduction in the UK's debt. And of course, that's false. The, the debt under Cameron's up 60%. Uh, he was referring to the deficit, but even that is also not contracting. What? What is he? Is he just? They, he, didn't, he was absent that day in Eton when they covered financial <laughs> uh, trends. Or? Well, I, I, I don't know if he turned up that day, or maybe you know he wasn't concentrating in his economics class. If indeed he did economics at Eton, but uh, the it's surprising how few people are able to distinguish between deficit and debt. And um, they actually did some kind of survey a couple of years ago, and a worryingly small proportion of politicians were able to distinguish between the two. And I think a few weeks ago, somebody actually had to sit down with Cameron and explain to him what the difference is between debt and deficit. And But to be fair to the Tories, they weren't targeting lessening the debt, they were targeting lessening the deficit. And to a certain extent, they've succeeded in doing that, but at the only at the cost of greater taxes and so on and so forth. All right, so the deficit the government's running at the end of the year, they just, that they can't pay off, they dump it into the debt. Absolutely. So that's basically the difference. Yeah. Well, you know, there's still, I don't even know what the deficit is, but the, yeah, the, the, the money, the deficit is the difference between what they take in and, uh, and what gets paid out. And they're paying out significantly more than they take in. And so the difference leads to okay. greater what debt. What the government takes in are tax revenues. Tax that's revenues, revenue. parking fines. Right. <laughs> okay. A lot of, mo mo most of it is, is re tax, tax, tax revenue. Tax that, revenue, that's the, yeah. That's the, you know, big bulk Some of Some of the deficit is covered through the debasement of currency. Okay. But when the minimum wage jobs in the UK are expanding, like McDonald's just expand, hire 2,500 people on minimum wage, the amount of tax that comes off a minimum wage job, it's not enough to pay down these debts. No. In other words, if McDonald's hired a million British people or five million British people. The amount of money it would cost to just keep those people going to their jobs, paying their transport costs, paying their tube costs, paying their heating bills, paying their taxes, by the end of the day, they would actually be a drag on the economy. It wouldn't offset the debt. Uh, it's not going to make any difference whatsoever. And the great irony with taxation is that people have found the more you tax people, you create the three Fs, fraud, flight and fight. And actually, lower tax revenues lead to greater, uh, sorry, lower tax bans lead to greater revenue for the government, partly because people are happier to pay tax, partly because a lower tax environment creates, is an economic incentive for people to work and trade and do business. And that leads to uh, economic growth and healthy economic activity, which leads to further government revenue. So the great um, a lot of the time, the, the, the raising of the 
tax rates on the rich from 40 to 50 percent. It didn't actually generate much, much more revenue. It was done uh, to, to, to be seen to be attacking the rich. We have the stamp duty on properties over £2 million in central London was raised to 7 percent now, which is a heck of a lot. You know, actually, all it's done is caused the property market over £2 million to just atrophy. And so government revenue has actually decreased as a result of higher tax bans. So raising tax doesn't always lead to higher revenue for the government. And I was reading uh, Alistair Heath over the Telegraph. Oh, yeah. uh, he's a good guy. And uh, Well, he's a journalist. Uh, yeah. well, and he, uh, is, uh, he's calling for a shock cut in taxes to below the rate in Ireland, which in Ireland I think is 12.5%. Uh, he wants it to be less than Ireland, to be the lowest tax regime in the G20, and that this would be a boost to the economy. I think it would be. Okay. So you don't agree with that? Well, you have it. You have in the UK. You have an incredibly uh, developed um, uh, government-sponsored entities like the healthcare and other subsidies yeah. of the government in this country. So the government, uh, you know, if you're going to cut, well, they're, they're they're trying to cut those. Yeah. Uh, right now, uh, and there's social unrest, which is uh, predictable and understandable because at the same time to get back to what we're saying at the beginning of the conversation, they're not doing anything to address these four big banks who are like trolls under the bridge taking all the money as it's coming off the printing presses. So it, it seems uh, like with Osborne and Cameron, if they're going to cut the uh, services, uh, the welfare, uh, they if they don't do some something, some, something compatible in the banking industry, they're just opening themselves up to huge problems, as they have done, right? I'm, I'm of the view that any type of regulation isn't going to work. It's just going to make things worse. And um, But what about the, the rule of law? Uh, is that something that you would agree is necessary? In a well, it depends what the law is. The law for the banking system has been repeatedly broken. Well, the, the, the bank over yeah, and over I, again. I'm not and defending the, the banking system for a second. Okay, but why yeah. not? Why not uh, get rid of those four banks and replace them with ten new banks and, and create competition? Well, I'm all for competition. Yeah, That's what we can agree. But, uh, I'm pro competition. Uh, listen, to, yeah, I'm pro competition as well, and I would stop bailing out banks, and I would uh, I would move to independent competing. Currency, so that banks, banks effectively, banks and government have a duopoly on money. I would remove that. And if a bank over leverages itself and the bets go against it and the bank goes bust, then the bank goes bust. And that's the end of the story. But as soon as you bail out the banks, you're just creating zombies and all the other things we talked about at the beginning right. of the conversation. I mean, this is where we have. But that's not a matter of regulation, that's a matter of deregulation of anything else, because regulation is protectionism, effectively, for the banks as it stands. It, at the it's moment. a matter of, of law uh, and yeah. order. They're, the banks are uh, regulated. But they're not obeying the regulations. Whether you yeah, need no more regulations, that's not the case. Or deregulation, yeah, the current regulations. the existing ones, and the you, crisis that we have would never have happened. That's right. Yeah. OK, so first of all, why, how come no one's gone to jail? Uh, and, and, and first of all, <laughs> why, why is Osborne supporting them? And why quantitative easing is nothing but to support the bond portfolio of a corrupt banking system. So why, why can they get up in the House of Commons and pontificate on the merits of various uh, cutting of various programs when he's doing nothing about the most vicious uh, destabilizing influence in this economy, the corrupt banks? Well, I don't think it's because he's corrupt. I think it's partly because he's badly advised. I think he needs to read up on By some By who? Gold. Osborne? Yeah. But I think Osborne is badly advised by whoever gives him advice. Well, where does the buck stop? Where, well, who, the Osborne ultimately... is probably advised by people who have been bankers at some stage in their careers. So, I mean, I don't know who Osborne's advisors are. But, I mean, I... I when, 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 when a bank like Barclays gets caught red-handed manipulating LIBOR rates, when a bank like HSBC gets caught red-handed laundering money for Mexican drug cartels, and their defense is, we're too big to go to jail, well, you can't prosecute us because we'll crash the system. How can this country that defeated the Nazis, uh, it helped defeat the Nazis anyway, be uh, completely ineffectual in defeating the terrorists in the city of London? How come they just laid down like dogs? Well, I can't answer that question, Max. I agree with you. Independent money is the answer. OK, so by independent money, you're saying there's a duopoly between banks and government. They and control money. They control the price of money. It gives them too much power. Right, and that by moving on. And they can create money. Right, and so an independent money, in your view and my view, would be something like a gold 
gold, oh. silver, Bitcoin, the, the Kaiser dollar, the Frisbee pound, all these things. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm up for all of that. Now, you mentioned Bitcoin. Unfortunately, at the very end of, what we, of our time, I would love to talk about Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to save it for another day. Uh, but I will mention that Bitcoin is trading at new all-time highs against the dollar. And it, it is. Because it doesn't have the problem of being manipulated by governments and by corrupt bankers, it's free to trade and free to uh, express itself as a free currency. And it's I, doing quite well. I wish I understood it better. It is a beautiful thing. It is totally open source. It is. It is uh, the the ethos behind it is wonderful. Um, and long may its success continue. That said, that I I have a few, but I don't have many because I don't entirely uh, understand how it works yet. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. We'll talk about Bitcoin another time. Thanks, Dominic Frisbee. My pleasure, and uh, I'll be glad to talk about Bitcoin anytime you like. <laughs> All right, and that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Dominic Frisbee. You can follow him on Twitter at Dominic Frisbee. If you'd like to contact us, you can email us at kaiserreport at rttv.ru or tweet us at Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.